What's up, YouTube? This is 82 and 0. So, as we all know, the NBA has been celebrating the 75th anniversary, and we got to see the 75th anniversary team. And I'm sure a lot of people remember the 50th anniversary team. But this is a video I want to make talking about the NBA 75th anniversary team. And not only that, just talking about the landscape of the NBA at the 25th anniversary, uh, 1971. Because I think a lot of people remember, like I said, the 90, in 97 when they had the 50th anniversary and what the landscape was then. And a lot of people obviously know the landscape today. But I think it'd be fun to look back in 1971, in the 25th anniversary. So there was a 25th anniversary team, and the stipulation and rules that they had was the players had to be retired at the, at the start of this team. Uh, you know, the votes can't be casted for players that are still in the NBA during that time. So, the 25th anniversary team was Bob Pettit, Dolph Shays, Paul Arizon, Joe Folks, Bill Russell, George Mikan, Bob Cousy, Bill Sharman, Bob Davies, and Sam Jones. And they also put Coach Red Arback in there. Now, one thing I want to point out is, in 1980, only four players of the 25th anniversary team were selected to the NBA 35th anniversary team. It's kind of crazy to see how um how fast the NBA evolved. You know, you're not going to see Joe Folks on any top 10 greatest players of all time list. And um another rule they had was you had to have been selected to all NBA team at least once because they didn't have all star games until the fifty one season. So some of these earlier players like Joe Folks didn't have as much all star appearances. So they went off of all NBA selections. Now the panel that got to choose it was Red Arbuck, Ned Irish, uh Haskell Cohen. Danny Bishon, Lester Harrison, Fred Zollner, Ben Kerner, Fred Schaus, and Bob Ferrick. Now, for people who don't know, a lot of these guys were early contributors. You know, Red Arbach being a coach. Fred Zollner was uh, the early Pistons owner. And he was nicknamed Mr. Pro Basketball. I should do a video on him sometime. Um, there were some nominees that didn't quite make the final cut. Guys like Tom Gola, Vern Mickelson, uh, Tom Heinsohn, George Yardley, Maurice Stokes, Richie Guerin, Slater Martin, guys like that. So looking past that NBA 25th anniversary team, what did the NBA look like at this time? So I kind of did my research on this and put this together. So the top five scoring leaders, all-time scoring leaders, and by scoring leaders I mean total points. I don't mean points per game. Where it stood at the end of the 71 season. Because I know some of these players I'm listing played past that mark. I'm not counting the points scored after that. I'm just counting where they stood at the end of the 71 season. The 25th anniversary. Wilt Chamberlain was the all-time scoring leader at that point with 29,122 points. Oscar was second. Oscar Robertson, that is. With 23,578 points. Elgin Baylor was third with 23,043 points. Jerry West was fourth with 21,003 points. 
Bob Pettit was fifth with 20,880 points. And getting into the championships where they stood at this point, because obviously today, you know, we have the Lakers and Celtics with 18, but where did the NBA stand at the 25th anniversary? The Celtics led the pack with 11 championships at that point. The Lakers had five. 76ers had two. Golden State Warriors had two. The Milwaukee Bucks had one. The Knicks had one. The St. Louis Hawks, or Atlanta Hawks, I guess, where they were known by, by then, had one. The Royals, which would become the Kings later on, had one. And the defunct Bullets team had one. Now, a lot of times people nowadays with the NBA 75 greatest players team, the GOAT arguments come up time and time again. And people are trying to figure out how to rank the top 75 players of all time. And I'm sure this happened back in 97 with the 50th anniversary team. I'm sure people back then... Like, I know Shaquille O'Neal, for example, said he didn't feel he deserved that nomination yet because he hadn't done much. Um, so you guys watching are probably wondering what the GOAT argument would have been in 1971. Well, here's how I could, you know, obviously I wasn't alive during that time, but with my research into the topic, what I've gathered on... I would say the fan perception and the media perception where people would rank players back then. Uh, so there'd be a huge case back then that Bill Russell is the greatest player of all time. Um, but I think some people would put Will Chamberlain above Russell because this is past the 67 championship that Rus that Chamberlain had. He finally dethroned Russell. So he knew he could beat him. And Chamberlain was the most complete all-around player they'd seen at that point. Russell was kind of one-dimensional in, in that he couldn't score 30, 40 points consistently, you know? So I think the GOAT rankings back then would be like, Wilt Chamberlain would rank, like, let's say there was an ESPN back then to rank. I don't want to go into ranking the top 25 players of all time, but I'm going to rank what I think people would rank top 10 players of all time at the start of the 71s or at the end of the 71 season. I think they would have ranked Chamberlain number one. I think Bill Russell would have been ranked number two. And. I think Oscar Robertson, they would have ranked number three. Jerry West would have probably been ranked number four. Bob Pettit would have been ranked number five. And I think George Mikan would still be in that top ten conversation at this point. He'd be number six, in my opinion. Uh, Dolph Shays would be number seven. And... Neil Johnston, I think, would be in that top 10 conversation. He'd be ranked number eight. Um, number nine, I think, would be Elgin Baylor. And the reason I think Baylor would be ranked lower than Johnston at this point, I mean, obviously, Baylor is ranked higher nowadays, but I think championships played a part. And I think people forget how dominant Johnston was and I think that'd be more fresh in people's memory in 1971 than in 2022. People don't know who Neil Johnston is today. Uh, but I think number 10, I'd go with Sam Jones. And Slash, I'm going to kind of cheat here, but I think Kareem Abdul-Jabbar would have a case because he just won the championship in 1971. I think what people could do is interchange Kareem or Sam Jones or any of these players for that matter. Um, this is just my personal ranking of the top 10 players in 1971. Or not playing in 1971, but you know what I mean, the history. 
where they would rank in 1971. Um, I think Kareem would have started to have a case for himself at this point to be a top 10 player of all time. And that's why I kind of cheated and had 11 players. But that's my rankings. And another factor I want to look at is in 1971, like I said, the, the league was pretty young, the 25th anniversary. I think people back then, if you if the NBA was bigger back then, obviously, it wasn't as big. Um, I think if people um, put this much debate into the GOAT argument back then, as they did in the 75th anniversary team or even the 50th anniversary team, I think a lot of people might want to, because it's still pretty fresh in their minds, I think a lot of people back then, if there was a go argument, would ring George Mike in pretty high. I'm, I'm talking about probably fans' input in this and... I think Joel Folks might have an argument during this time, too. Um, this was just my personal ranking, but I could see people uh, ranking Mike in as high as number one. I could see people ranking Russell number one or Chamberlain number one. I think this is very interchangeable. But that's where I think the GOAT argument would stand, where the top ten players in NBA history in the 25th anniversary would stand. and you kind of got to delete everything you know looking back at history forward, right? Delete everything that you know that happens after twenty five, the 25th anniversary. Because a lot of times people try to look back at history with a recency bias, you know? So i trying to look purely at what the NBA landscape would look like, you know? Put yourself in the heads of an NBA fan in 1971. Uh, I've tried to talk to people that were alive during that time that were avid NBA fans, and I kind of gathered some opinions from them. I mean, and this is this is purely speculation on my part. I didn't live in this era. And it's purely anecdotal, too, because I'm only interviewing a few people from back then. You know, they're not... Every, they're not speaking for everyone. But what I've gathered is from the people I've talked to that watched basketball during that time uh, avidly is where the NBA stood at 1971 was, for the most part, what I understood is Chamberlain was the greatest player and Kareem was this up and comer. And it's look, and from what I understood from talking to somebody I know that watched it back then is Kareem was supposed to be this next up and comer, which he did become that during that time, they thought he was going to dominate the seventies the way um, Bill Russell dominated the sixties. And Oscar Robertson was considered the greatest guard of all time during this time period. George Mikan, um, the person I talked to didn't really watch basketball that early, but he knew who Mikan was. Uh, look at it like this. Kids today watching the NBA, and by kids I mean, let's say, the average 15-year-old watching LeBron James. They know who Michael Jordan is, you know? They know who at least the generation before them is, the big stars, right? They don't they might not know the early, early players though. You know, you ask a 15-year-old who George Gervin is, they're not gonna know who he is. Uh but they know most of the stars from I, I wanna say at least the one generation before. So from what I've gathered, there was a lot of respect for George Mikan still. Uh, now you don't even see him on GOAT conversations, which is a topic for another day. But there was a lot of respect for George Mikan and the early pioneers during this time. Uh, they weren't considered dinosaurs at this point, <laughs> for lack of better terms. Uh, Joel Folks was still pretty highly regarded. But 
the NBA was starting to shift towards being more above the rim by the late 50s. Uh, for lack of better terms, the NBA was becoming less white. Um, th- so the play style was changing, and the players were getting a lot taller. Um, this is why it's a myth when you hear people say, oh, Wilt Chamberlain only played against five foot six white guys. It's not true. I think they're in some ways, and this is not to diminish the earlier, earlier players, like from the 40s and early 50s. Um, I think a lot of times people confuse the late 60s and early 70s with Will with like the Joe Folks era. And I know it's a straw man too to say five foot six. Like even, even though the NBA was shorter in the late 40s and early 50s, it's not like they were five foot six. Uh, these guys were still six foot eight, you know. Mikan was still six foot ten. So, I think um, if you would have asked the avid, or not the avid, like if you would have asked a super fan back then, right? Somebody who knows his history, somebody who loves the game and appreciates it, I think he would have had a great deal of respect for George Mikan for. Joe Folks for Dolph Shays, although they're enthusiastic about the future with Kareem Abdul Jabbar. Uh, but it's sad because you don't see as much of that with NBA fans today. A lot of them don't really care about the past, and it's pretty sad. But that's what I liked about this 75th anniversary team and the 50th anniversary team. It's it's cool looking back at all the pioneers who contributed to the game. So that's where the NBA landscape was in 1971. And I talked mostly about Kareem, but there were other up-and-comers too. It's not just... Uh, one thing we got to look at is there were two leagues during this time, right? There was the ABA, too. So to make a top 25 greatest NBA players of all time, look at it like this, right? Some fans of the sport back then might not have even been impressed with that list because there's a whole other basketball league with professional players. I mean, Rick Barry jumped ship and went over to the ABA. Julius Irving played in the ABA. Um, Elvin Hayes played in the ABA. So a lot of the talent pool was being taken to another league. It doesn't mean that the, the, the era itself wasn't talented. I mean, uh, if you add the two, uh, if you add the two leagues together, uh, in terms of number of teams, you could have a very good, uh, what's the word I'm looking for deep in terms of talent league, you know, lots of parity. So I'm not trying to shit on this era. I'm just trying to make you think as a fan in that era what the perspective would be in 1971. So, Because we're talking about the NBA 25th anniversary. We're not talking about ABA and NBA. So they so some a criticism of this might be from a fan during that time. You know, think about a fan that watches ABA basketball more than NBA. Um, they might not even care about that NBA list. They might prefer the ABA. They might prefer their style of play, you know. So that's just something you got to look at too. And there's a, another factor too into looking at where the NBA landscape was during this time. Um, if you were to live back then as a fan, um, in 1971, you don't see this league competing with the NFL. or And I know it's not at the NFL's level today, but these players aren't household names like they are today. You know, majority of people know who Michael Jordan is or LeBron James, but and I'm sure a lot of people back then knew who Wilt Chamberlain was, but it wasn't, he wasn't as popular. So being a fan back then the NBA 25th anniversary might not have been as important unless you were like a super, super fan, which I'm sure they existed back then. I'm sure it's always existed, but I'm saying by and large, it wasn't, 
it wasn't as popular to talk about back then, I'm sure. So those are my thoughts on the 25th anniversary. Uh, I want to try to do an NBA at 35. I want to do an NBA at 50 just to kind of cover the narratives of the time, cover the up and coming players, cover where players of the past stood in that time in terms of ranking to cover what it would be like to be a fan in that time period. That's the goal of this video and the series. And I think we all know today with the 75th anniversary, you know, you see a lot of play people getting mad that players were left off. You know, do you think anybody that was left off of the 25th anniversary team deserved it? That's what I'm trying to ask. So let me know your thoughts down below. Thanks for watching.